So, Walter, can you first just give us a little background on how BP and other oil companies go about drilling in the ocean? Do they actually own their own land? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your full question. It sort of buzzed out halfway through. Could you repeat that, please? Oh, of course. I wanted to know, can you give us just a little background on how BP and other oil companies go about drilling? Do they actually own the land that they drill? Well, in some cases, they own the land that they drill on. Uh, we're now talking about land. In some cases, they uh, lease it from other private people. In some cases, they lease it from the government. In the case of um, a BP oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, they got permission from the U.S. government's Minerals Management Service, and that's how they were licensed to uh, drill at the place that they drilled at. I see. So how long have we had federal land in the outer continental shelf? Do you know that? Well, um, it's been a good number of years. I don't know the exact uh, amount, but this is not a a new uh, uh, departure. I see. So in Austrian economics, or as Michael McKay likes to say, reality economics, we believe in totally private land, even private oceans. How does this even work in the ocean? How do you divide up the land? Well, the, you know, it's interesting. The, the oceans comprise, what, 75% of the uh, Earth's surface, and the land comprises 25% of the Earth's surface. And the oceans are unowned, and they contribute to world GDP, I don't know what, half a percent, a percent whereas the 25% of the Earth's surface that is owned by people, not all of it, governments hog up some of it, it uh, uh, creates 98% of the GDP. And uh, the reason for this is the tragedy of the commons. What the tragedy of the commons is is that if something is owned in common, people tend not to take as good care of it as they otherwise would. And if they own it privately, they take very good care of it uh, one of the examples I use to illustrate the tragedy of the commons is the cow and the buffalo, which are very, very similar animals. The cow has always been owned privately. The buffalo um, was unowned, similar to the uh, tragedy of the commons of the ocean, and almost went extinct. And the reason for that is that if you own a cow and you shoot it, the cost to you of shooting that cow is one cow tomorrow that you don't have. Whereas If there's a buffalo running by uh, freely uh, where the deer and the buffalo roam and all that, and you uh, shoot it, the cost to you is nothing because if you didn't shoot it, you wouldn't have it tomorrow anyway. Somebody else would have had it. Right. So you tend to uh, overuse or more quickly use uh, common resources than you use uh, private resources. Okay. So that is, in the sense that if, a, if I own a private property, I want to get the most value out of it. Is that what homesteading means? Well, homesteading is a little different. Actually, let me cut you off here. We're about to go out to our first break. So sure. when we come back, we'll talk why it's such an important function in private property. So we're with Dr. Walter Block, and I'm guest host Zoe Russell. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Radio Free Market. I'm your guest host, Zoe Russell, taking over the reins from Michael McKay for today. This is a live show, so give us a call at 1-800-313-9443 if you want to call in and ask Dr. Walter Block any question you may have. We were just talking about homesteading and what homesteading means and why it's such an important function in private property. Yes, homesteading is the traditional way in which you get to own land. Uh, There's virgin territory. You go out there and you uh, clear the tree stumps and you uh, put in uh, uh, some corn, and uh, you then own those 100 acres or whatever it is that you cleared, and uh, you now have homesteaded that land. The uh, challenge is, well, how do you homestead or how do you put into private hands rivers, lakes, oceans, things like that? Because what I try to establish in the last segment is that if you don't, you have the tragedy of the commons where people tend to misuse and overuse uh, the resource. Well, there are various ways that you could privatize. Uh, Remember, uh, I'm in New Orleans, and we'll never forget Katrina and the overflow of the Mississippi River that landed in our our basements and in our first floors. Well, 
if there was a Mississippi River Corporation that owned it and was responsible for it, uh, presumably they'd do a better job than the Army Corps of Engineers who uh, uh, don't lose money when something bad like this happens. But how do you get the Mississippi River Corporation to go in the first place? Well, one way is whoever homesteaded the Mississippi River. It's a little difficult this late in the day. I mean, if this had been done in, I don't know, 1750, uh, we might have had a clearer shot. How could we do it now? Uh, it's a little bit like unscrambling the egg, but the way I would say is take every city or every person that lives within five miles of the Mississippi River or ten miles, and uh, every person who has been on that river other than just once or twice as a, uh, as a, a rider in a, in, a, in a cruise ship, and let's say there are 15 million such people that live there or work on the river uh, regularly. Well, now what you do is you uh, create this new thing called Mississippi River Corporation, and you have 15 million shares, and you give one share to everybody, and now that company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and you could buy more shares, you could sell your own share, and now you have a, a viable company that is responsible. And similarly for the uh, the Gulf of Mexico, you take New Orleans, you take a few cities in uh, Florida, western Florida, you take a few cities in Texas, such as uh, Houston, a few cities in Mexico, and let's say you have 50 million people. Well, you now have a company called the Gulf of Mexico Corporation, and it's owned, uh, 50 million shares of it are owned initially, uh, homesteaded by these people who can then buy and sell more shares, and now you have responsibility. Because if the Mississippi River Corporation, sorry, <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico Corporation allows BP to uh, drill uh, for oil, it's going to be a lot more careful than the Minerals Management Service who were uh, accused of, I don't know, watching pornography when they should have been on the job. Uh, and in any case, the mineral, uh, the MNS doesn't lose money when you have uh, the, the spill, nor does Obama, uh, whereas this company would lose a lot of money, so it would have a much greater incentive uh, to make sure that accidents like this didn't happen in the first place. Will this be perfect? No. Uh, look, uh, Bill Gates makes mistakes. Uh, uh, Ford and Chrysler, private companies, make mistakes. It's just that in the private sector, when you make a mistake, you lose money, and this tends to uh, stop you from making too many more mistakes, because if you do, you go bankrupt, and you're taken over by more efficient uh, people. So uh, to to get back to your question of homesteading, that this ideally uh, would be the you know you mix your labor with the land or the water and you get to own it. Uh, nowadays we might just uh, get things in the private hands, and the key is to get things in the private hands. That's something that the Soviets learned in 1991 when their economy went kablooey. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're doing a lot better. Well, the way they privatized it was a little. Um, Problematic, but at least it's in quasi-private hands, which is better than the Soviet system of uh, central planning. Right. So we can cover some of the issues that come up when the government is the property owner. But first, I want to know: is that the correct term? Is so the government is the property owner of the Gulf of Mexico? We well, don't have the same. Sorry, well, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's one way of putting it. Uh, in effect, the government is the property owner. Another way of putting it is that there's really no owner; it's an unowned resource. But either way, it's, it's uh, economic uh, illiteracy, it's, it's economic debacle. When the government owns something like the post office or the public school system or the, uh, uh, the projects, the housing projects, it screws it up. Right. Uh, so when it's, private when it's owners, not owned, it's no good either. And private owners have a certain value that they've determined for their plot of land. This is what they can get out of their plot of land. So how does the government even try and find a value for public land? How do they go about doing that in a case where they've got, you know, this $20 billion escrow fund that BP has put up? How did they come up with that number? Well, it's pretty arbitrary. Uh, I mean, the government could have a an auction for its land, and that would be one way of determining it. Uh, but in the private sector, the, the way you determine uh, the value of cars or shoes or wristwatches or land or houses or whatever is by uh, the market. You buy and you sell, and uh, you get a market price every day. So in this bill, currently, with all this public land, who can even claim a loss on their land that they don't own? 
like a fisherman or a chef whose business has lost money due to a decline in seafood, can they sue BP? Yeah, well, this is uh, for the courts to decide uh, or for uh, Obama to decide, I guess. Uh, and I don't know how the courts will determine these sorts of things. But, uh, you know, they, uh, no matter how they decide, there is some sort of um, problem, at least for the libertarian, um, Look, uh, suppose you own a restaurant and I decide not to patronize you even though I've been a regular customer of yours for years. You can't sue me because uh, we have an arm's length arrangement. You know, I come at will to your restaurant. Well, you know, if I decide not to come to your restaurant because I want to go on a diet, you know, you can't sue the, uh, the diet people. So I don't really think that um, restaurants should be able to uh, sue uh, BT. I think that the only people that should be able to sue BP are uh, people whose land gets oil on it or uh, uh, fishermen maybe because, you know, in in effect uh, uh, you've gotten oil on their land, which is the ocean. Uh, But, you know, it's it's interesting that um, uh, the the way these people are going is uh, is just nothing short of horrible. If you wanted to... uh, get a uh, list of what not to do with the oil spill, you should consult what um, Obama is doing. Uh, for example, first, he's, um, he's not allowing poor Bobby Jindal, our governor, to put berms, that is, big sand banks, to protect the, uh, uh, the Louisiana coast. Uh, I don't understand that. Uh, you know, surely there are some sort of states' rights where uh, Bobby Jindal, if he wants, can put in uh, sand protection for the uh, environment. Uh, another one is this thing called the Jones Act. Mm-hmm. What's the Jones Act? The Jones Act is this piece of labor legislation which says that the only boats that can uh, ply the waters of the Gulf of Mexico or indeed our coasts in general are uh, uh, boats that are owned and operated by Americans. Well, you know, America is not the world's leading expert in everything, and when it comes to clearing up oil, there are other countries, such as the Dutch, who are very used to dealing with the oil spillage because of their dikes. And those guys have got much better technology, techniques, and much better trained uh, people on their boats. And they've offered to come in and help for free, but the Jones Act says they can't, and Obama is beholden to the unions, and he's not allowing them to come. It's very similar to what happened in uh, Katrina when FEMA wouldn't allow people to come in from, uh, I don't know, Ohio or Texas or wherever they wanted to come and help us. And, you know, there were all sorts of boats with uh, hotel uh, accommodation on their boats, and FEMA turned them away. FEMA mm-hmm. turned uh, people with uh, tractor trailers full of ice or water or orange juice. Uh, very similar situation to what Obama is doing. It's almost like he wants to make uh, the BP disaster even in worse. Right. and But at the same time, they'll blame it on BP. I have a quote from Energy Secretary Stephen Chu. He says, I don't want to dwell on coulda, shoulda, woulda. There's nothing I can really point to that we shouldn't have done based on what we knew at the time. So you bring in these regulatory agencies that aren't experts in the field and let them guess at it with a very high learning curve. Yes, well, you know, people are now blaming private enterprises, saying, see, BP, uh, British Petroleum, they're a private company. Look what they did. We need more government. But this is nonsense. This is nonsense on stilts. The Minerals Management Service uh, required of BP that they file a plan with them in terms of what will happen. Well, BP did what the MMS said. Uh, it's the MMS's fault for not uh, uh, better regulating. It, it, it's you know it's that old refrain. First, uh, 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 the the market is there, and the market is not perfect, so there's a little problems. So they start in with regulation. They have regulation A. Well, regulation A causes problems. Instead of going back to the free market system, which is not perfect, but a lot better than government, they go to regulation B, which screws things up even more, and they say, well, see, the market is failing. We need regulation C and D. Right. And uh, I think we're up to X now or Y or Z. Right. Uh, well, it's a similar thing with the Minerals Management Service. They, they've been regulating BP... Uh, up front, sideways, backwards, east, west, north, and south, and now they're blaming BP? Give me a break. 
you see that, um, I mean, I think that public property, or private property rather, is just a tenet of Austrian economics. And I see when they break that, it's just a self-reinforcing cycle. M larger and larger government growth stems out of the first mistake of just veering away from private property in the first place. I think uh, you said it very well. Okay. Well, I guess we'll head out to another break here. We'll be right back to Radio Free Market. We were just covering... Um, regulation of public property by the government and coming up we'll talk about it a little bit more and some of the problems that come about welcome back to radio free market again this is a live show so you're welcome to call in to 1-800-313-9443 i'm zoe russell the guest host today and my guest is dr walter block we are talking about bp and the regulation that private property provides instead of having all this mess of public property. So let's just go into regulation a little bit. I'm going to read you a quote, a comment that I found online, and I just thought it wrapped up perfectly what people always tell me about industry. It's pretty clear that self-regulation never works because industry has always has to keep increasing profits, and cutting corners is an easy way to increase profits, even though it can have massive negative effects for the rest of society. We need the government to be the cop who forces industry not to harm the rest of us. In terms of um, industry in a private ocean, would you still have regulations on business? Well, you know, in a sense, I don't fully disagree with it, although I certainly disagree with the tenor of that quote. Uh, certainly you need cops. Uh, not just for industry, but for anybody. Look, uh, you know, uh, A is a big fat bully and B is a 90 pound weakling and if A hits B, you know, somebody's got to tell A to cut it out. And there's fraud, uh, people do steal from each other and businesses are not uh, immune to that. So, uh, the cop has to be a referee. Uh, the, the cop has to, um, make sure that uh, people don't uh, violate each other's rights. But uh, but when you have a referee in a hockey game and he picks up the stick, uh, the hockey stick, and he starts shooting the puck through one of the nets, well, then he's no longer the referee. Then uh, he's uh, the central planner of the Soviet Union. So there's all the world of difference between a cop who keeps people off of each other's throats and stops rapes and murders and thefts and stuff like that on the one hand, which is legitimate and reasonable, and on the other hand, where you have this uh, stultification where they regulate every darn thing under the sun. They regulate how much water you can have in your toilet bowl. They regulate the, what kind of ladder you can have. They regulate what kind of tops have to be on your pillbox. I mean, uh, that way is, is the Sovietization of the economy. Mm -hmm. that, that's not just regulation. That's taking over. Right. Now, uh, what's happening in, in the Gulf of Mexico is, unfortunately, uh, the bad kind of regulation, economic regulation, which is not limited to stopping uh, people, uh, as in the quote, from cutting corners. Yes, you cut corners and you sell a, a pound's worth of fish and it's only got 15 ounces, you go to jail. But who's the best guarantor of that? Uh, is it uh, the government or is it private enterprise? And, and a case can be made that even for that sort of a thing, uh, you're much better off uh, with a private certification agency. For example, kosher foods. Is kosher foods a governmental thing? No. Uh, but they uh, they uh, certify the quality of, of, of certain foods. And, uh, you know, th there are uh, private agencies that certify that the, the scales in, in, the, um, in the butcher shop or in the bakery are, are going well. But uh, okay, uh, government. Uh, at least, if you have, a, if you're having a limited government, the government should be limited to that sort of a thing. But the government is doing way more than that. They're not just blowing the whistle against the uh, a foul in hockey. They're, as I said before, they're actually picking up the stick and, and shooting the puck into one of the nets, and then you know the, the game is ruined. If I can make that analogy, uh, for example. Uh, getting back to the BP uh, case, there is an environmental rule that it is illegal to dump water into the Gulf of Mexico that has more than 15 parts per million of impurities. 
okay, yeah, maybe this is a reasonable rule. I, I won't get into that. But right now what you have is with this massive oil spill, you've got the 10,000 or 100,000 uh, per million of impurities, and you have these Dutch ships that can scoop up acre, uh, acre feet of water, gigantic amounts of water, scoop it up uh, where it's got 100,000, say, impurities per million, and put it back where it only has, uh, say, 25 uh, uh, parts impurities per million, and they won't let them do it because the crazy environmental law says that you have to have no more than 15 parts per million. You'd think that if, if um, Obama had any uh, horse sense or common sense or whatever, he'd say, okay, look, this is a, a not unreasonable rule during uh, ordinary times, right. but this is not ordinary times. Let, right. Let's let those Dutch ships come in and scoop up all the crappy water and uh, dump a little crap back into it instead of, uh, you know, you have to travel thousands of miles away to put the stuff in an uh, environmentally safe uh, uh, situation. So th mm -hmm. there's just no uh, common sense there. Well, we have a caller on the line, um, so I'm going to let Patrick from Pennsylvania ask his question of Dr. Block. Patrick, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Zoe. Uh, thanks ahead. for taking my call, and I want to say I think you're doing a great job in Michael's uh, absence. And hello, Walter. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. Uh, Good to hear from you. I uh, uh, teach a, a class at the University of Iowa uh, in the spring in Austrian economics, and um, I just wondered if you could give me your take on this to make sure that I'm actually uh, sort of presenting this properly. How, how would um, you respond to someone who says, well, homesteading uh -oh. is fine, but Patrick, we can't we're let coming up on a break. Rushing. I'm going to have to cut you off, and then we'll get right back to your question at the start of the next section, which is our long section. So everybody just stick around through the commercials and come back to Radio Free Market. Hello, everyone. We're back. Radio Free Market and myself, Zoe Russell, are here with Dr. Walter Block. And I believe Patrick from Pennsylvania is still on the line. Patrick, can you go ahead with your question? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Block, I wondered uh, if you could respond to a common um, uh, concern that people have about homesteading. They'd say, well, that, found, that might have been fine for the Wild West in America, but we certainly cannot allow the, you know, the Russians or the Chinese to come into the Arctic Ocean and grab up all that oil. Uh, and just say that they own it because they take it. Well, uh, what do you have to say to that? Well, uh, you know, Canada is really uh, rabid about the Arctic, that they sort of own it, but if they don't do anything to it and someone else does, I don't, you know, I don't see why the first come, first serve rules shouldn't apply to take the Antarctic, uh, the southern Arctic. Uh, let's say I go down there and I... Uh, homestead uh, 10 square miles of it by putting in a couple of buildings and all. Or now that the NASA is uh, falling apart happily because I'm against the government doing this, suppose I go up to the moon and I uh, start uh, homesteading some crater or 10 square miles of the moon uh, and I uh, build uh, whatever it is and I, I have people there. Why shouldn't I get to own the moon? And if a Chinese person does it, we shouldn't allow them to? I mean, if it's virgin territory, uh, uh, the first guy there should get it. Now, if uh, I mean, if Canada was there first and they've used this stuff, which I very much doubt because uh, there's a vast amount of the northern Canada, um, and I don't see what the U.S. has got to do with it. Can this is more a Canadian sort of thing. But if they're not using it, you know, I'm with the philosophy, use it or lose it. By the way, this really isn't an Austrian question. It's more of a libertarian question, but that's a minor point. Uh, how does this idea grab you that the first person who homesteads the land, if it's virgin land and no one else has touched it, uh, should get to own it, even if he has yellow skin as in Chinese or whatever skin color the Russians have, just the same as us? Uh, why shouldn't they get to be the owner of it? And also, similarly, if uh, there are parts of the Soviet, uh, what do you call it, Arctic, that they've never used, why shouldn't someone from Africa be the first to use that and, and get to own it? Well, I agree with you, Dr. Block. In fact, that's what uh, 
Fortunately, thank you for validating what my uh, answer has been to that. And it does seem to me preposterous that any nation can just lay claim through fiat by just saying, well, we just own the Arctic. Uh, I said it's very much like the ridiculous claims of the Spanish uh, conquistadors who came to uh, the eastern shore of North America and claimed all of the continent for the, the king of Spain. Oh, that's, uh, that's just ridiculous. Look, uh, even within the continental U.S., I flew over, uh, what was it, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, the Rocky Mountains. I tell you, the Rocky Mountains are empty, empty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so suppose some Chinese guy or some Martian uh, landed in the middle of, uh, I don't know, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Utah, one of those places where the Rockies are. My geography isn't my strong suit. Why couldn't a Martian, a nice peaceful Martian, or Chinese, or African, or I don't know, whatever, uh, just say, okay, look, uh, I uh, now uh, have homesteaded this land, I've fixed it up, I've uh, got a corn crop, or whatever it is I've done. Uh, I don't see the justice of claiming that I own stuff that I never touched. Yes, well, and especially when we're talking about the most um, politicized commodity on the earth right now, which is oil, uh, if the Russians, for example, spend what would have to be billions of dollars to drill in the in the hostile environment of the of uh, the arctic and they pull out oil that's oil that goes on to the market that is in, it increases the supply of oil in the world uh dr- lowers the price of oil we all benefit from that and the russians have spent their money to to get it why would just to, from an ethical standpoint, would they not be entitled to reap the rewards for bringing us a product that we all want? Uh, Precisely. And also, it would be nice if the Russians were logically consistent. And uh, what's the northern area of Russia? Uh, well, Siberia, I suppose. Siberia, that's it. Now, suppose somebody from Africa or Siberia or Mars, I, um, Venus, whatever, uh, goes to, the, um, to, to those areas uh, and... Um, uh, the Russians should be uh, be willing to allow that. In other words, if we allow them to come to our so-called territory, they should reciprocate. But whether or not they do, uh, I, I fully agree with you. Ethics requires that the first uh, homesteader has the best claim on it, much better claim than someone who just said, "Well, I claim, you know, I claim the sun, the moon, and the stars." That's just crazy. Very good. Thank you, Doctor Locke. My pleasure, Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Thanks for contributing. All right, so I guess we'll get back to regulation. Um, I have a quote from Barack Obama, and he said, President Obama, and he said in his address to the nation that oil companies showered regulators with gifts and favors and were essentially allowed to conduct their own safety inspections and write their own regulations. So does this oversight, does this behavior surprise you from a regulatory agency? Oh, no, this doesn't surprise me one bit. Uh, you know, uh, let me get into the theory of regulation just a little bit. The uh, first theory of regulation is that uh, the free marketplace, free enterprise is no good. They're a bunch of bums. They're cutting corners, and what we need is government to regulate them. Well, th- this is nonsense because um, we can trust uh, the cleanliness of the bathrooms in McDonald's uh, much better than we can trust the cleanliness of the bathrooms in the post office because uh, if the post office bathrooms are dirty, or the service is bad, uh, they don't lose money. Whereas if you go to McDonald's and, and you don't get the service you want, you go to Burger King and uh, Wendy's or whatever. So competition brings about a better product. But the second one is this thing that Obama is talking about. It's called capture theory. And here the idea is that at one time uh, the market was bad, the capitalists were exploiting the customers, which is ridiculous, but that's the theory. And then uh, we had regulations, and, and the, regulator, the regulators were regulating the business in favor of the consumer. Right. And what happened is you had capture, namely the regulatee, the business, would start showering them with gifts or to put it in a, a labor economics point of view. The way to really get uh, a promotion in the private sector is to go become a regulator and then go back to the private sector in, in a higher capacity, and then go back to the regulators. So you sort of have this um, back revolving and forth, door, right? A revolving door. Of per- I couldn't have said it better. I was looking for that word between the regulator and the regulatee, and the gifts go back and forth. And this is called capture theory. But the the third and even more sophisticated level of of uh, regulation is uh, what happened with the Food and Drug Administration when that first came in. Uh, and there's this guy, Gabriel Kolko, K-O-L-K-O, who 
historians who did a lot of good work on this. And what he said is, to put it in my own words, capture, schmapture. There was no capture. This regulation was initiated by the companies in the first place. Why? Because the, the big uh, meatpacking companies and the big drug companies were losing market share to smaller upstart competitors. And they said, whoa, we can't allow this. What we got to do is come up with some sort of scheme, the FDA and the meatpacking inspection and the railroad regulation, which uh, sets out regulations which are easier uh, for big companies like us to um, satisfy because of economies of scale. And also, we're going to put our people in these regulatory bureaus, and we're going to regulate the hell out of these upstart competitors of ours. Now, that's the most sophisticated notion of regulation, where it's the big businesses that are ostensibly the victims of regulation who are actually uh, favoring it and, and actually starting it. So right, Obama you call is it protection, not regulation. Yes, yeah, it's a protection racket, <laughs> precisely. Right. Um, so, so all uh, these increased levels of bureaucracy, they drive away business from the upstarts and they protect the business of the largest companies. Right. You see, and, and even uh, the less sophisticated view of Obama, the capture theory, it's absolutely right. There is some capture, but, but Obama and I draw the opposite conclusions from it. What Obama draw, uh, the conclusion that Obama draws from capture theory is, well, we've got to get in uh, 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 Simon Pure regulators who will, will not be uh, um, uh, captured or will not be given gifts or we have to stop this revolving door business that you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, my attitude is, uh, you know, lots of luck uh, to that. That's the human condition. The, right. the, the uh, conclusion I draw from this country theory is not we need more and better regulators. It's rather the marketplace is the best regulator. Let's get rid of these regulatory agencies. Let's get rid of the minerals management service. Let's get rid of FEMA. Let's get rid of the Army Corps of Engineers. And let's let people like McDonald's and uh, Burger King and, uh, and Microsoft uh, and Google uh, run these uh, kinds of things on, on, uh, on the basis of markets. Right. I think, I mean, what, what's happened with the Minerals Management Service is that the agency has changed names to the Bureau of Energy and Management of the Environment or something like that, the BOE, and they've gotten a makeover. They're going to be split into three separate bureaucracies so that they act as a watchdog on one another. So this probably wouldn't stop the favors and the lobbying. You don't see that happening. No, and I think that's a very good point you're making. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of... The problem with public housing, we used to have high-rise public housing. Now, the problem with public housing, as Jane Jacobs tells us, is one, they don't allow any commerce there, which uh, screws up the uh, whole society. And secondly, they have these income cutoffs so that if you make more than a certain amount of money, you're not qualified. And if you get a, a raise, uh, you have to leave the public housing projects, which means that most of the public housing projects are headed by women who are unable to control the teenage boys. And that's why, that's the problem with public housing. But what these idiots uh, derive from this is they said, well, the problem with public housing is that it's high rise. So we've got to have low rise public housing. Oh, which is ridiculous. I... Because you have the same old income cutoffs and you have the same old lack of commerce, which are the real causes. And you're quite right. If you break it up from NNS to BOE, and you have three BOEs that each look at each other, they, they'll all be captured by each other. Right. So you're quite right. So another thing, you know, even if they were very, very um, moral and they did the right thing and they believed in their job and they're serving the people, can a government body really, truly keep up with the technology of the oil industry, some of the newest and most complicated technologies that exist? You see, what you really have is the problem of central planning. And Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian economist, uh, more than anyone else showed that the, the problem with central planning is, is you know, it, it's insuperable. You can't uh, rationally plan your way out of a paper bag. And even if we get rid of the superficial problems of capture and the, uh, the, the cocoa point about the, the initiation of these regulations, suppose you had... Uh, uh, regulators who were impenetrable, who were not uh, bribable, they were robots or whatever, human beings that they were just highly moral and they would never be uh, suborned by gifts or anything like that. Still, uh, they're not part of the market. It's only when you're part of the market and you're part of the price system that you can have a rational economy. 
these people have no way of uh, uh, telling uh, what what is appropriate. For example, uh, because of uh, left-wing environmentalists, BP had to drill in very, very deep water. I think the, the water is about a mile deep. Mm-hmm. They would have preferred to drill closer to the shore uh, where the water is, say, 25 feet deep. And look, if you have a problem and you're dealing with 25 feet deep of water, it's a lot easier to solve than if you're dealing with the 6,000 feet of water, which is roughly a mile. Well, how would the regulators know what proportion of oil drilling should be done uh, close to shore in shallow water or deep out in deep water? Even if they're moral and they wouldn't accept bribes or they wouldn't be suborned or they wouldn't be captured, this is an entrepreneurial decision. And, and uh, if the Gulf of Mexico Corporation made a mistake, well, then they'd go broke and you get someone who did a better job. But if the BOE makes a mistake, do they lose money? No. No. So they're not part of the market nexus. There's no reason to believe that even if they were highly moral, uh, that they would succeed. In other words, the morality is just a superficial criticism of this. There's a deeper criticism, that's the economic criticism, and the economic criticism is that these guys are flying blind. They have no way of knowing uh, uh, where to drill, what kind of drilling to do. Uh, there, there are all sorts of technical issues. You know, uh, should you use tungsten? Should you use platinum? Should you use rubber? You know, uh, these guys don't know that. Mm-hmm. Right. I had a, a good friend of mine who works in the nat- natural gas industry. I'm based out of Houston, so a lot of us work in the energy industry, and she spent a horrifying several days with her regulator, her inspector, going through all the various things that they had to change just to meet code. And did that make them safer? No. It's just various changes that they had to make in what they were previously doing. Now, that's quite right. This is the way uh, the bureaucrats work. They uh, make uh, sort of arbitrary, capricious rules, and they insist that you follow them. Um, let me give you another example from one of my recent books, on uh, privatizing roads. I uh, hope we're not coming up toward the break, but if we are, I guess we can continue it. We've now, got a couple minutes. You okay. Now, the statistics on roads are that some 40,000 people a year die on the nation's highways. Now, that's a big number. Mm-hmm. The, the U.S. servicemen in all the years that we were in Vietnam were only about 50,000 deaths. And uh, if you look at how many people are dying, uh, U.S. servicemen... Forget about Iraqis and Afghanis. We don't count their deaths. Um, but even U.S. servicemen, it's just a couple of thousand. A 9-11 was only 3,000. Uh, Katrina was only uh, 1,100 or 1,500. This is 40,000 people a year who bite the dust because of the goddamn socialist highways. Mm. And uh, is this on, on the, uh, the news? Is Obama talking about this? No, no, no. no. Of course not. And uh, what does the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration do? They have all these stupid rules about seat belts and, um, I don't know, uh, all sorts of silly things. Um, you, you know, like they have this uh, thing, um, what is it, 70 mile an hour zone? Mm-hmm. And it's perfectly legal to drive at 65 miles an hour in the left lane. Mm-hmm. And most people in a 70 mile zone, they want to drive, you know, 75 I mean, if right. you go on the highway and you go at 70 miles an hour, virtually every car is now zipping right by you. Okay, so here you got some idiot sitting there in the left lane at 65, and he's just tootling along, and he's creating a, a ruckus because cars are trying to wiggle in and out to try to get past him. And, uh, you know, as far as the highway is concerned, they come up with these stupid signs on the road. Uh, how is that addressing the problem? So this is very similar to what you're saying uh, in, in other words, regulation is all of the piece, whether it's on the land, whether it's on the water, wherever it is, whether it's drugs, whether it's uh, schools. You know, They've got stupid, arbitrary, capricious rules that they insist on happening. Uh, the best example of this is, um, what do you call it, the airplane travel. They um, steal well. our toothpaste. They steal our nail clippers. Right? right? And they don't allow pilots to have guns. Uh-huh. I know. I mean, it's just very silly. Uh, Whereas what they should be doing in order to uh, promote safety, well, I'll talk about this after the break. Okay. Yeah, coming up, we'll just have our short little wrap-up segment. So thank you, Dr. Block. We'll be right back from these commercial breaks. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Radio Free Market. I'm here with Dr. Walter Block, and before you got cut off, you were telling us how uh, federal regulations keep us safe in the air. So can you tell us more about that? Well, I, actually, I was denying that. I mean, <laughs> federal regulations don't really keep us safe. They have no. arbitrary and capricious things about the a big toothpaste is no good, but a little toothpaste is fine, and, and uh, you know, uh, fasten your seatbelts, and, you know, all these uh, government regulation rules and stuff that don't do much. They don't allow airline pilots to carry guns, even though most of them are ex-military. Uh, it's just crazy. What they should do is uh, get rid of this uh, bureau, this government regulatory bureau, and let each airline implement its own policies. El Al, the airline from Israel, has been under attack more than most, and they haven't had one uh, problem. Uh, maybe uh, El Al could... Um, rent out some of its people uh, to uh, American Airlines or what have you. I don't know, but I don't, you see, the, the problem is that if the uh, the safety board of airlines makes a mistake, they don't pay for it. They don't go out of business. Whereas if uh, Southwest screws up, Southwest is toast. So you're going to get much better regulations from the private uh, sector than you're going to get from the government. You're going to get not going to get these arbitrary things about taking off your shoes and now they have these pornographic X-ray machines and mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, and at the same time, you could pick and choose which airline you wanted to go with based on the enforcement level that they have. Right, and each airline would have different enforcement and, and, and would possibly change their enforcement. Look, if I were a terrorist, the, the, the thing I'd like most is if every airline had to do the same exact thing and it didn't change. Mm-hmm. Then I could, uh, easy. maybe I could figure out something. Whereas right. if each airline were different and, and every airline changed its uh, thing a little bit without getting uh, permission from Washington, D.C., we'd be a lot safer than we are now. So this is just one more uh, instance of uh, regulata- regulation, government regulation gone amok. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely what's gone amok with this latest BP spill is the fact that Obama put a moratorium on an entire industry that props up the whole Gulf. What kind of message do you think this sends to oil companies? Well, it's a very bad message. Uh, my friend Bob Higgs, who lives around here, said, look, you know, industry is, is dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, farmers get hurt by tractors, and, you, you know, we don't have uh, sweatshops anymore. We don't have uh, John, uh, Dickens kinds of um, uh, factories, but people still get hurt in factories. People get hurt fishing. Uh, you know, just because you have a, a, a mess... Uh, you know, we're, we're denied perfection. We don't have, we're not on the right side of the Garden of Eden for perfection. So when you have a problem and you just ban the entire industry, well, that's another instance of regulation uh, going crazy. Look, uh, uh, Congress passes bad laws. Should we get rid of Congress? Wait, maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could work. Um, so how do you ultimately see this bill being politicized, meaning how do you see it affecting energy policy in this country? What's that expression? A tragedy is a bad thing to waste. Uh, that's what the oh, and um, the crisis. I thought it was uh, crisis is a bad thing to waste. What you have to do is pile on more regulation. That's what they're going to do. Every t- they, they just need an excuse for more regulation, and this is certainly an excuse. Uh, we're going to have more regulation. We're going to have more environment, left wing environmentalists as opposed to free enterprise environmentalists uh, running around trying to run everyone's business. Uh, uh, happily, Obama's. Um, What do you call it? Uh, Approval ratings aren't that good, so maybe uh, that'll slow them down a bit. Yeah, maybe we'll get the next, you know, regulatory agency in the coming up four years. But anyway, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Walter Block, for being with us and being my guest. I'm guest host Zoe Russell, and this is Radio Free Market. Please visit us on the web at RadioFreeMarket.com, where you can download this and all of our shows for free. So until next week, wherever you are, please stand up for freedom, and thank you for listening.